audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. What's going on, y'all? Why are y'all so quiet? Is it finals week or something? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> y'all just went for food, right? That's the worst position a speaker can be in. It's in between an audience of hungry college students and friends. <laughs> I wouldn't say good evening, but for most of you, this is good afternoon, good morning almost, right? This thing I want you to bed. But alhamdulillah. Um, the good news is, well, the bad news is that I have to speak before the food. The good news is, oh, the good news is, sure, I thought I saw the smell of the samosa. No, you're free, then you're fine. Um, the good news is that, inshallah, the talk will be quick and light, inshallah. I'm like your dinner. Um, so, I really, um, you know, the sister who did the introduction, she mentioned about being put through difficulty. Uh, ten days ago, I took my love for Derek Rose, may Allah protect him and cure him. I took my love for Derek Rose to a new level by tearing my ACL. Uh, but alhamdulillah, I'm still walking, which is actually phenomenal, alhamdulillah, mashallah. Uh, please don't know me. And um, then this morning I was on a flight, which was uh, very early. My flight left at 6 a.m. from Knoxville, so I had to be up about like 4.50. And then I go to the airport, and it's Knoxville, it's a smaller airport. It's not in the middle of nowhere, it's nice. Um, but I got from my car to the gate in like 8 minutes, so that was nice. But then I got to D.C., and true story, so I just landed in D.C. I was supposed to get to New York by like 9.30, JFK. And uh, I get to D.C. where I'm connecting, and I go to my date, and there's like nobody there. And it's like that awkward ghost town feeling in the airport when it's really early, and nobody's there. And you're just walking around, and you're like, the Dunkin' Donuts isn't even open yet. <laughs> like, the lady's like, what are you doing here, right? So I go to the gate, and there's, a, there's a, uh, one of the employees at the gate, and I'm like, um, excuse me. And she's like, yes. I'm like, are we supposed to be boarding? Because you're supposed to be boarding literally right the minute that I got there. She goes, no, uh, the plane's not here. <laughs> and I was just like, that seems like a problem. <laughs> but when is it going to be here? She goes, we don't know. <laughs> and I'm literally like, okay. And then at that moment, like, the droves of people, like, you know, FYIs, like, literally, they came behind me and they were all also, like, very upset once they came to get here. So I had to sit in Dulles Airport for four hours this morning waiting for a plane. For those of you who know Bill's Airport, it's not quite Raven or anything. It's not really that exciting. It's just a bunch of carpet. Um, that was a <laughs> but, um, so I sat there for a while, and it was just difficult to keep on difficult. My leg was throbbing because my ACLs, you know, my surgery, so I'll have to schedule it next week. And I was just sitting there, and it's kind of love. Um, I opened up my laptop, and there's free Wi-Fi. <laughs> and that, to me, was just the moment where I just looked up to a lot of things. <laughs> There's nothing worse than being stranded and having to pay $24 for a couple hours of Wi-Fi. And um, that truly, to me, was a great tip syrup in the Ronald Studios talk. That verily with every difficulty comes so far to me. Um, so with that, I wanted to say that it's, it's an honor being here. Um, sometimes speakers say that at the end of the talk, and it seems kind of interesting. Because it's like, well, thank you so much for talking about it. But I want to say that in the beginning, because it, it really means a lot that you would come and spend in the middle of finals week. Uh, nonetheless, some time just coming and joining with each other in fellowship, hanging out with one another. Uh, for those of you who came with the intention of eating, I also want to forgive you. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I also want to reward you. But just to be able to spend time with one another is good. And actually, as a mental health student and as a counselor, uh, it's great to take some study breaks in time. It's great not to bog yourself down by hitting the books too hard, right? Um, so coming to things like this is very important, and it's, it's, it's an honor for me to be able to share some moments with you about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whether or not you are, are, are Muslim or not, whether or not you really identify with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or not, there's a lot of lessons that we can take from his life. Whether or not you are uh, you already are there, or you believe him to be a prophet, or whatever your personal value system is, there's always some good that we can take from every person, right? Um, well, most people, right? Not certainly. Uh, but, <laughs> sorry, I had to do it. So, 
there's a couple things I wanted to say. I don't have that much time, uh, but we do have a little bit of a Q&A, but there's a couple thoughts I wanted to share. And that is that, um, did you change it from in the shade of the prophet to the shadow of the prophet? No, 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 that was a chapter. Uh, okay, can I just... Is there a text button? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? Oh, it's a picture? Because the whole talk kind of ends with like this epic conclusion about shade. You don't understand? <laughs> <laughs> Just ruined it. Alright. <laughs> I'm giving a TED talk tomorrow, and so I've been on PowerPoint literally for the last 12 hours of my life. Um, in the shade of the prophet. Okay, forget what you saw. It's in the shade. Okay? Um, no, I mean, there's some, there's some interesting things about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. First of all, everyone say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at least once. Okay? Say it. Say it like you mean it. I've heard y'all call radio, radio stations for like One Direction tickets with more enthusiasm than that. Your brother's all like, yes, yes, you as well. Zay Malik, is that for funding? So, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a very interesting person. And the reason I say this is because you don't get to meet very many people, or get to come to know very many, very many people, who have the uncanny ability to be able to tie in their personality and their experiences with a variety of people, a diverse portfolio of individuals. There are very few people in the world who can say that they can relate to so many different people, but if you look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you see that he was somebody who, was, his life was filled with so many experiences, and part of the wisdoms in that the scholars talk about is that no matter who you are, where you're from, what kind of situation you've been in, you can point to some instance or event in his life and say, I know what he was going through, right? And so, for example, the Prophet Sallallahu was born without a, or he was born and his father had already passed away when he was born, right? And in the culture back then, according to the, the norms of the time, he was considered an orphan. And so if any of us were born as an orphan, which actually is a lot more common than you think, I have two or three students who are orphans in Knoxville, then they are able to relate to that. They are able to say that these feelings that I feel about not being able to connect with my parents in a way that maybe I see other kids doing is something that the Prophet had with his father. The Prophet's mother passed away when he was, how old? Six. Six years old, right? We should know this. We all know what kind of underwear Michael Jordan wears. Pain, very good. So, yes, yeah, still? I don't know. Contract over? I don't know. So we all know we all know the intricate details of certain celebrities' lives, but if we don't know the certain details about the Prophet's life, what does that say about our knowledge of him and our relationship with him? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi mother died when he was six years old. Interestingly enough, yesterday I was just talking to a young person, a, a young male from my community, a young man, whose mother passed away when he was six. And so there is a sort of uh, ability to connect with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi had a, uh, a variety of different experiences in life, and so we look to him for that. Now the problem is that sometimes we are raised uh, in the Muslim ethos, in the Muslim atmosphere, with a, with a lack of a relationship with the Prophet Muhammad That we feel like he is almost like a demigod, and that we can't look at him and call him an older brother or a mentor. In fact, we almost feel like it's disrespectful to call the Prophet Muhammad an older brother. But I doubt, uh, from all the teachings that I've gone through with my teachers, that he would, besides being a prophet and the best of creation, that he would feel offended if anyone felt, felt him that way. In fact, I think that that would be that was the goal that he had was to come off as that, that he was somebody who was a mentor to people, someone that could guide people in a way that they felt comfortable. And you find later on in some stories that we're going to tell that he was very approachable, much like an older brother. But one of the things that's unique about the Prophet Muhammad and this is something that connects us to him immediately, is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about him. Now, you know, there's a certain emotional uh, effect that happens when somebody else has to tell you how much somebody cares about you, okay? So it's one thing when you have a friend who's like, yo, I really care about you, right? <laughs> and if you're, like a, if you're like a true bro, you're like, bro, not now, right? <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's nice to hear that. But it's a completely different experience when somebody else comes to you and says, you really don't know how much this person cares for you, right? You sort of feel just the overflow of empathy, and you're just like, wow, you're almost taken aback. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes the liberty in the Quran to tell us exactly how the Prophet Muhammad feels about us when he said, 
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم لقد جاءكم رسول من أنفسكم علي عزيز عليه ما عنتم He says that verily indeed لقد means for sure without a doubt okay so Allah subhanahu wa taala says لقد جاءكم that verily there has come to you to all of you من أنفسكم from amongst yourselves and this is very important right because if we admit if we understand someone for being amongst us then we can relate to we can relate to them. I'm from Chicago, right? The best city in the United States of America. Right? <laughs> the best big city in the United States of America. And we can't really talk about basketball right now. Well, neither of our teams can Well, at least we made the playoffs. But when Carmelo comes to the Bulls, inshallah, <laughs> then we can talk. But I'm from Chicago. Last week I was in Philadelphia. And there, there was a conference and there were some speakers and speakers from all over. Some speakers from Philly, some from Maryland, some from... Uh, just all over, subhanAllah. Some from uh, New Jersey, unfortunately. Some from uh, Dallas. And there was one other speaker from Chicago, right? So I don't live in Chicago anymore, but I'm, I'm from Chi-Town, born and raised. Born and raised. And subhanAllah, when we connected the fact that we were from Chicago, what was our reaction? What do you think it was? We were like, oh, snap, right? And everyone else was on the outside looking in. Because no one else had that connection. So I saw Sheikh Ubaid Law and I was like, he's like, man, where'd you grow up? I'm like, man, Shaq's on Born and Raised. He's like, oh no, for real though, for real. And he's like, man, I'm from Brooklyn. I was like, no way. He's like, yeah, man, I grew up with your sister. I'm like, oh my God. And we just like, connected. and then we actually, and from that point, I didn't even realize this until now, everyone else was eating dinner and we actually shared plates. Like, we were like, you want to try some of this? He's like, no, try some of mine. And we didn't offer it to anybody else. So we were like really connecting, right? Once you share your food with somebody, that's real. That's life. <laughs> so we had that connection. That's what min and fusiko means. Like from amongst you. Now maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not talking about specifically, oh, he's from your city, so if you're not from Mecca, tough luck. No, he's saying from your people, from you. He has the same characteristics as you. He has the same sort of norm that he is. He's the same makeup as you are. And so instantly in the ayah, right before Allah tells us anything else on the Prophet, He's saying what? Connect with Him. Just like the way I connected with Sheikh Obedullah. Just like we shared food immediately, our comfort, our barriers just broke down immediately. We should feel no barriers between us and the Prophet Muhammad And that's one of the purposes that Allah SWT mentions that first. So He says, مِنْ أَنْفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَلِتُمْ That it is extremely difficult for Him, and bothersome to Him, to see what you are going through. It, it weighs on him the difficulty that you experience. Right? Remember what I said earlier? It's a, such a different experience when somebody says, you don't know how much this person cares about you. Right? And again, in Sunday schools, and Saturday schools, and Islamic schools, we're not really taught the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from his lens. We're taught him, and we're taught about him as a person who was like an amazing leader, an amazing general, an amazing statesman, an amazing person. But we're not really taught about him as like an older brother mentor figure for us. Right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Azizun alayhi ma anitum, harizun alaykum bil mu'minina ru'uf ruhim. That he is, and it's, again it reiterates this fact that he's so concerned about what is going on with the believers, right? And his mercy is just, is just un, 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 unlimited, un, un sort of bridled, right? And so from the get-go, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us about who this person is and how much he cares about us. And that is one of the best feelings that someone can have for the state of their mental health, is to hear how much somebody cares about them. And so let's use this as a muse. Let's use this as a starting point for this discussion tonight about how the Prophet ﷺ felt about us. Now, the Quraysh, who were the Quraysh? Who can tell me who the Quraysh were? Sounds like a cool indie rock band name. Quraysh. Anyone? Who were they? Man, the state of Sunday schools in New York is dropping grass. <laughs> Who were they? Um, okay, so the tribe of the Prophet was a part of. Now, were they particularly fond of him? No. That's, in the beginning, okay, in the beginning they weren't, okay? They were, they were not particularly fond of the Prophet myself and They were known to be some of his staunchest enemies. And they would oftentimes have all these sort of objections, they would have all these sort of issues with the Prophet myself and And one of them was actually quite interesting. And in fact, they thought it was one of their strongest proofs against why the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they thought it was one of the strongest proofs against why he was a prophet but in fact all it does when you look at it from an analytical perspective is add to his greatness as a prophet they would say to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to his followers if this is truly the word of God if this Quran that we just heard recited much all beautifully 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward the brother. If this is truly the word of God, then why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send down an angel? Why didn't God just send an angel directly? Why did Angel Jibreel have to go to the Prophet Muhammad and teach him and give him the Quran? And then the Quran had to be from, why, why have a middleman, so to speak, Ayah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Why didn't the angels come straight? Because that would be so miraculous, everyone would have to believe. If Angel Jibreel just walked in this room and was like, sup? Right? <laughs> and just started reading the Quran, we'd be like, well, there's no doubt, we all have to believe, we all saw, we all know that that's not a human experience, that's clearly metaphysical, that's more than us, right? And so, not only does Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala respond to them by saying, you still wouldn't have believed, right? But he also leaves that argument there, as if he's not afraid for us to analyze and look at it. So why did the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, why was he a human being? Why was he somebody who could cast a shadow, right, and give us some shade, right? Why was he somebody who could do that? What was the wisdom in that? Number one, we're going to go through four points, inshallah, as to the wisdom of how we can relate to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the goal is that everyone leaves this room tonight with a renewed connection to this man, Ayah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and some sort of benefit that can happen to life. And everyone's calling me. Please stop. Okay. Uh, so, number one, human beings. Okay, so the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was human beings. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, "Kul inna ma ana bashrun mislukum." Say to them, "I'm nothing but a man, just like you." Now, obviously, he wasn't a man just like them. I.e., he wasn't in the same quality as them. But he was a man or a human similar to them, mithlukum, right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes this point in the Quran, what is the value of this? Well, human beings are just that. They are human. They are human. I was teaching a study circle to my youth group in Knoxville, Tennessee, right? To my group of young male, female, and a couple of goats. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we don't have goats in um, but I was talking to them about a certain story, and this story is actually found. It, it, is, it is a narration that is uh, passed down in some books and in Sahih and other books, where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi had received revelation from Angel Jibreel. What was the first word that was real? Anybody? Ikra. Ikra, right? What was the first ayah? Does anyone, does anyone know the first, first section? Very good. So it, it, uh, the, the, the first portion of that surah was <coughs> re- revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What did he do immediately after? Huh? He would say, Man and Defire, I'm not a reader, I'm not a reciter. And then Angel Jibreel would squeeze him, right, and let him go, and he would again say, Ikra. And then he would respond again, Man and Defire. So that, ha- that event happened. Who did he go to immediately after that, that very traumatic event? He went to his wife, Khadija. Okay? He didn't go to his best friend, Abu Bakr Siddiq. He didn't go to any of his family members. He didn't go to Abu Bakr. He didn't go to his cousin. He went to his wife, Khadija. This shows us something about the marriage of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, particularly about his marriage with Khadija al Anha, but this is not to say that the other marriages were any worse off, no, but that he went straight to his wife, right? There's sort of this sentiment that, like, when I have something on my mind that I want to talk about, I'll go talk to my bros about it, right? But when it comes to, like, my wife, like, I'll talk to her about, like, what she made for dinner, right? <laughs> or, like, did she put the kids to bed, right? But the Prophet says something, he smashed this sort of misogynistic culture that was prevalent, that was pervasive in Mecca. And he went straight to his wife. Now, a lot of people don't know because this hadith is sometimes uh, passed over in different forms of sirah, but we're all old enough to understand, we're all old enough to uh, process this correctly. The Prophet Muhammad after this moment, between that time and the other time where he would, where he would receive more revelation, Surah Muzammah and Surah Madasir, he would go walk around the town and he would see Angel Jibreel around the town. So imagine this, he didn't know Angel Jibreel was Angel Jibreel, okay? Angel Jibreel didn't come down and was like, hey, I'm here, look, ready? Get ready, 23 years, like, it wasn't like that. Angel Jibreel, I said, comes down, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is frightened, has no idea what this being is, and what he's being told to do, and what purpose it's for, until Angel Jibreel makes it clear to him. Then after that, and I want you to imagine this happens to you, and you start walking around campus at St. John's, and all of a sudden, everywhere you turn, you start seeing this Angel Jibreel figure. Okay? And think of it like a movie scene, right? So Angel Jibreel's sitting on the bench, and he puts down the music. <laughs> right? You go and you buy food, and he's the guy selling you your food. <laughs> like, everywhere the product, literally, the Hadith says that he turned in the marketplace, and you would see him, you would turn around to walk through the way, and you would see Angel Jibreel again. Right? And so he thought he was going crazy. He thought that something was, was, going, was up with him. And so the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu became so stressed out about this experience, and so concerned about this sort of event that had happened, that he actually went up to a 
mountain, the same, the same mountain from Jebel, Jebel Nur, and he actually stood at the edge. Now, he wasn't suicidal. He wasn't somebody who was mentally ill and he was like, I'm going to kill myself. But he literally stood there and says, if this is true, like, is this worth it? Is this burden? Am I going to be strong enough to carry this? And so he had that feeling of stress that just overwhelmed him. He actually stood and looked over the edge and contemplated if his life was worth continuing. When I told this story to my youth group, I had a line of people afterwards telling me all about the times that they had contemplated suicide. <laughs> and how they had never known that the Prophet Muhammad was in a position that was slightly similar to them, and had they known, it would have been very comforting in their time of distress. Right? Why was the Prophet Muhammad human? Because human beings are just that. They're human. And when we are able to relate to one another and build on each other's strengths and experiences, that's where we grow stronger as well. So that's number one. You have all the other stories talking about how the Prophet Sussan was human, right? And so back then, they didn't have prom, right? How many of you guys have like a serious existential dilemma when prom came about? Anybody? No. Yeah, one guy in the back. Thank you. Everyone's like, what prom was that? I don't even know what Quran is, right? Come on, dude. So, thank you for being honest. So, prom is a big deal. I'm not sure in New York. I mean, New York, you guys, just, I don't know, you guys might go to, like, Jaro's Pot or something. And eat <laughs> but prom is a serious thing, right? Especially in, in other parts of the country. And a lot of Muslim young Muslim people are very, very uh, torn about whether or not they should go. Now, for those of you who aren't aware of why it's even a big deal, it's because prom went from, like, this downtown Abbey, downtown Abbey-esque, like, classy, sort of, like, gathering the promenade, so like straight up just bump and grind, right? Like that's all this is all that goes on there. And so in this sort of atmosphere of immodesty, the question that the believer has, the Muslim believer is like, should I be there? Should I be a part of that? And that's a serious question for a lot of high schoolers to ask because it ties in directly with their identity, their self-image, their social group, their peers, and so they're very concerned. So one thing we did in the Sierra class about the Prophet Muhammad was that I told them a very interesting story about granted it was before he received Waki. But there's still an understanding that before the Prophet Sussan received revelation, there was still, obviously his heart was clean, so he was pure in his intention and action. And God protected him from making mistakes like this. And so one time, there was a sort of era of shindig that was happening. It may or may not be called Swam, maybe Bram, I don't know. But there was like this era of shindig that was happening. And so the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he is... He makes plans to go. Now I want you to think of all the parallels, okay? So when I'm giving this class, I'm speaking to high schoolers and college students. So I start making parallels, and some kids start laughing so hard because I do, I nail exactly what they did to go to prom. So I'm like, okay, so the Prophet Muhammad says, his occupation was, what was his job, his part-time job? He was a shepherd, very good. So a lot of kids in my youth group had part-time jobs. So I'm like, look, he worked just like you did. Like, Allah SWT didn't just send him a stipend every week, like, here's a bag full of gold, and he's like, what? Right? He would work for it, number one. So, and I told the young person, you work for your, your money too, right? He said, yeah. Then I said, okay. So then he finds out that he has to work the night of the prom is. Oh, no, right? So what does he do? What does a person do when they find out they have to work on the night of something they want to go to? What do you do? You trade shifts. Very good. I love it. So the prophet says, he goes and finds another shepherd. He's like, yo, you watch your she- can you watch my sheep on Friday night? I'll watch your Saturday morning, right? Literally, not literally, he's trading. He asks someone else to walk, take care of his flock, okay? Then he gets all ready, okay? And I told the other people, look, this is what you do. And he gets all ready, and he hands off the sheep. I said, that's exactly what you do when you get a tuxedo on. Your mom's like, where are you in, Britain? And you're like, the library. <laughs> <laughs> We're having a formal study session tonight. It's up in the morning. Right? And I'm wearing, I have to wear a bow tie. I wasn't on the end. <laughs> so I, I, the Prophet Sallallahu was taking steps to make it to this event. And I said to all the high schoolers and people in the world, I was like, you do too, right? Now what ends up happening? Well, he makes his way down, and he's narrating the hadith. This is after he received walking. He's making his way down to the Brahm, and he sees, and he starts hearing about the music, and there's people in there, and there's all kinds of, you know, lewdness going on, and he says that, I felt my eyelids become very heavy. Meaning what? He's starting to get a little bit tired. So he said, you know, I'm not going to go to the party tired, like, let me rest up a little bit, and then I'll go. No problem, I'll just quickly take a power nap, wake up, and I'll be good. So he said, I laid down, I closed my eyes, and I woke up with the sun beating down on my face. Meaning he what? He missed Brahm. Okay. So when I told the, the young people the story, I said, what's the wisdom behind the story, right? Because does that mean like the, the Islamic the Sunnah has to take a nap before prom? If you wake up and you're good, if you don't, then this Allah's called it. No, I said this, the Sunnah is that you might have the best of intentions. Do any of us think the Prophet had negative intentions going to that? 
No, he just wanted to socialize, just like each and every one of us want to socialize. Each and every person in this room loves to be loves to be with other people that they consider friends, right? But there are some environments where it doesn't matter really what your intention is. You could have the best of intentions. Those environments will still affect you. They'll still affect you. Human beings are nothing but products of their environments. Nature and nurture, right? And so there's a sort of present theme in, in Islam that what you are, you become a, you become a person who is the people that you are around. So if you, whatever kind of friends you want to attract, be that friend. If you want to have good friends, be a good friend. If you don't really care what kind of friends you have, then maybe you don't have to worry about what kind of friend you are, right? And so we learned this. Now when we were able to tell the story, the kids were so able to connect. Why? Because of his humanity, the human element. You also have the story of how he got married, right? How many of us, our parents, ever talked to us about love? Okay, let, 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 let's, let's triage this a little bit, okay? How many of us, how many of our parents talked to us about what gender we were? Anybody? Okay, girls, yes? Okay. You guys are like, I still don't know, actually. <laughs> uh, this one parents make me take anatomy four times, so I gotta go. <laughs> okay. So, what gender? Like, your parents are like, okay, these are the parts that you have, and this is what makes, okay? Some parents don't do that still, apparently, okay? How many, of you, how many of your parents talk to you about the other gender? Anybody? The same guy I promised back. Okay. <laughs> so, how many of your parents talk to you guys about sex? Yeah, buddy. <laughs> I knew it, right? No, and I, and I appreciate that, dude. I appreciate that because, listen, young people are going to learn all about sex. Okay, they're going to learn all about it. It just matters where they're going to learn about it from. It's not a question of if, it's a question of where and when. And so why like, why not teach it to them in an environment that is healthy, that is supportive, and that is open so they can ask questions instead of having to Google the answers, right? That's probably not a good idea. So the Prophet Muhammad he and his first wife Khadija Anha, our mother Khadija, they had a very interesting proposal stage, right? And a lot of young people, have, have any of your parents talked to you about like having crushes? Any of you? Crush on boys? No? Some of you are saying no, some of you are saying yes. Some of you are like, what is a boy? <laughs> Anyone crush on girls? Anybody? Your parents? Same. Okay. <laughs> I'm getting a very elaborate painting of your high school years. Uh, so, you have, so you have like parents who will talk to their kids about crushes. And I've heard parents say this. I've heard parents say this phrase. That love is haram. <laughs> Anyone heard this before? Wow! Yeah, you heard it? Yeah, honest girl, don't be afraid. Yeah, I've heard parents say this. No, love is haram. Right? There is also this one, there is also this one, uh, this one shaykh that I know, who I really respect, and I think it was a, I think it was a lost in translation moment, where he was talking to a group of young men about how he really wanted to tell his wife how much he loved her. And so he made like a nice, like, uh, basket of like like snacks and like drinks and he was like let's go on a hike. So they went on this hike, okay? And keep in mind this guy's like straight from Bangladesh, okay? <laughs> <laughs> My wife's from Bangladesh too, okay? So I can like I'm even talking about about you like I Okay? So I have to be careful to say it's on the guy's side. Right? Okay, so this guy's like straight from Bangladesh. And I think his wife is actually a Caucasian convert. So Amazing, like ability to communicate. Probably some, a lot of funny lost in translation moments, and this is one of them. So he, he goes up the mountain, and they start like you know snacking on the on the, the goodies and the drinks and the snacks that they made, like sandwiches and whatnot. And then he's like, "Wife, I want to tell you something." <laughs> She's like, "What?" And you know, I got it down right. Yeah. And the W they put an O before it. Wife. <laughs> Because they speak a lot of Bangla around me, and I'm like, I'm just going to back away. <laughs> and he goes, there's a lot of talk. There's a lot of talk about, he said, there's a lot of talk about spouses being friends. <laughs> he goes, but you are not my friend. <laughs> you are my wife. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> and those of you are still waiting for something romantic, that was it. <laughs> that's the end of that story. You are not my friend, you are my wife. Write that down. It and let me know how I'm going. <laughs> okay. So we do have sometimes like a distorted idea of what love is and courtship and romance and sex and animals and beauty. That's fine. We're growing, right? We're growing. It's a growing pain that we're getting through. And you start to see more and more discussion now into that healthy discussion, appropriate, modest discussion. But the problem with Muslims is that many people don't understand that when he got married to his first wife, Khadija, it wasn't like he walked into a room and was like, 
Prophet Sassan used to work for Khadija Gulaman, right? And this is where it becomes interesting. I just did a talk at a local private school, and the, the question I got in every single class that I lectured in Islam for like four or five classes was, not even did you get an arranged marriage, but what is an arranged marriage like? As if I know, right? <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not dogging anyone who did, because they, sometimes they work. Like, for a lot of people, they work. But to, to assume that that is like the default standard in Islam, that we get arranged marriage, that's how it is, is a really, really interesting misnomer. And so, if we look back at the authentic sources, we find that the Prophet used to work for his wife. Now, what did she find attractive about him? Well, he was a very kind man, he treated people well, he was a sadiq al amin he was truthful, he was trustworthy. And so she found all these amazing characteristics, and of course when you work with someone, you get to interact with them on a basis that is healthy, that is professional, and you might get to glean some characteristics of their personality, and so she noticed this, and she sent her, her associate, Maisara, and she said, can you go tell him uh, you know, that I'm interested, in, and see if he'd be interested in marrying me? You guys remember in class when you get those notes, do you like me, circle yes, no? I used to get a lot of those. Why are you laughing? Uh, so, yeah, get over it. I'm just kidding, I didn't get a lot. Uh, feel bad. Uh, just kidding. So, this is literally what she's doing. She's sending somebody to tell him, do you like me? Yes, no. I like you, do you like me? Circle one, yes, no. So, my sister goes to the Prophet from Muslim, and she says, listen, what do you think about Khadija? And the Prophet's like, she's a great boss. And my sister's like, no, what do you think about, like, Khadija, like, in that way. And he's like, no. <laughs> and she's like, yes. And he's like, no. <laughs> and he could not believe it. He was like, no. He actually, and he says, he said, there's no way that she would want me. Right? He was so humble, like, adding on to this resume of amazingness. He just goes, there's no way she would want me. Right? Like, why would someone of hers, because she was noble in her family, she was someone who had a lot of money, a lot of wealth. She was somebody who was uh, very beautiful. She was somebody who was looked at by society as like the, the perfect girl, the perfect woman. And so he says, why would she want someone like me? And I was like, trust me, she is interested in you. And so this, what does that do now? That story alone, what does that do to this shade of the Prophet Sassam that we're talking about? See, because for some people the shade is very narrow. For some people the shade is not like, you know, vast enough for us to sort of sit in. But when we hear this story, then young people are like, wait, so it's okay to have crushes on people. And we say, yeah. And we say, that's just part of the human experience. The response or the, the okay or not okay is how we react to those questions, right? What we do if it's a healthy reaction or not. And, and subhanAllah, you'll find some of the most amazing and beautiful poetry. You know, Adi Rabbi Lahman, he stood at the grave of his wife, Fatima, when she passed away, Rabbi Lahman had. And he said an amazing couplet. He said to her, and this is the translation, he said, what a, what a, um, he basically called himself like crazy, but he said like, what a, what a crazy person am I that I'm standing at the grave of my beloved and I'm offering her salams and she's not responding to me. That's from, our, that's from our books of history. But our tradition doesn't allow for people to think like that sometimes, not on its own, but how it's being interpreted, right? And so the shame of the Prophet Sassan in this regard is very vast. And his human experience, his human element is very important. How many of you after hearing those two or three stories automatically feel closer to him? Anybody? Feel close to the Prophet Sassan? Knowing that, yeah, he had some times and tough times. Yeah, he got married in a way that was kind of cool and romantic. And yeah, he encouraged it, right? So let's continue. The second thing about what's interesting about the shade of the Prophet Sassan and, the, and the, the, the human experience is that it allows us to be able to connect to the Prophet Sassan in a way that is loving, right? Now, if I ask you the question in Sunday school, do they teach you that you should love the Prophet Sassan? Yes? Okay, so if I ask you the question, do you all love the Prophet Sassan? What would be your answer? Yeah, people say yes, right? So if people were like, went to the <coughs> Muslim, grew up Muslim, and, or merged Islam, or whatever, and they got Islamic education at some point, they know that part of this religion is to love the Prophet Muhammad so But what's interesting is that this love, it has a couple proofs, okay? There's a couple, you know, necessary proofs to this love. If I say I love someone, but I don't ever do anything that shows that love, do I really love them, right? Everything has proof in life. When you're hungry, what's the proof of that? Uh, your stomach hurts, okay? Do you guys ever get those stomach noises? Yes. Where it feels like your stomach is eating itself? <laughs> Anybody? A little bit graphic, I know, but just stay with me, okay? When you're tired, what's the proof of being tired? <coughs> Yawn, okay? Or just fall asleep, okay? When you're excited, what's the proof of that? What? 
Heart raises, smile, like hands a little bit sweaty. Come on, look at your eyes. All right, hands a little bit sweaty. Okay, so everything has a proof. What's the proof of love? Huh? Heart raises, okay. We're going back to excitement. Okay, and hungry for some people. All right. A proof of love, my contention that love involves two proofs, two main proofs. Number one is imitation. Okay? When you love something or someone, you imitate that thing. You know, I grew up in Chicago in the 90s. I was born in 88. And I was just at that age where I was cognitively able to enjoy the Jordan years. Yeah, uh, a life of mashallah. We may have lost my life for like a years, not, not Jordan. I really am not a huge fan of him as a person. Those years were some of the best years of Chicago sports ever, right? And there were a couple things that Jordan did that were iconic. That kids all over the city... I mean, the country, really. We're trying to copy, okay? Anyone wearing any Jordan gear right now? You are? Where is it? On oh, your shoes? Okay, what's the logo? What's the Jordan logo? What's the Jordan logo? What's the logo on your shoes? He's dunking. Okay, well, he's not quite there yet, but he's... So he's got his legs spread, and he's doing this, okay? That was an iconic Jordan move, right? The legs spread, and he pulled the ball like that. So iconic. That symbol became such a symbol of Jordan... That now on his multi-million dollar or whatever industry and company of clothing and, and textiles and whatever, that is his logo. When you see that, you know that it's a Jordan brand thing or that someone got it from Pakistan as backwards. Okay? Or like the ball's back to his foot. Jordan's something, right? So that has become now what happened now when, when Jordan did that, okay, multiple times in games and dunk contests and whatnot, you had little kids who couldn't even jump over a piece of paper. Right, flat piece of paper, doing that. They would just be walking around the house like this, right? <laughs> because their love for Michael Jordan was so strong that they wanted to imitate him. Another thing that Jordan did was what? What was the other thing that he did? Uh, the push off. Thank you. Bitter? Bitter? <laughs> what was the other thing he did? A little tongue? He did that when he was like, when he was about to cross over somebody, he'd let the tongue kind of hang out a little bit. I don't know why. There's a lot of rumors that he grew up in a very hot climate, so when he was playing basketball outside for days on end in the summer, his tongue would just kind of droop out. I don't know. But you'd have kids walking around with just like puddles of drool surrounding them. Because they would just walk around the house just like... <laughs> right? Why? Because they love Michael Jordan. There was even a song, I Want to Be Like... Mike. Mike, a very famous song. He's playing the radio, I Want to Be Like Mike. What is more what is more of a proof of love than a song, I want to be like Mike? Literally the lyrics are, I want to be, I want to be like Mike. Like Mike, I want to be like Mike. Genius. <laughs> like that dude's right to die, he's like, I got it. <laughs> I want to be like Mike, X3. Want to be, X3, like Mike. <laughs> Take me to the bank, right? That's, that's love. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is... This person who is identifying with us now, the, the height of the human experience, the problem so Sunday, do we have love for him? Don't say yes. Instead, ask yourself, how do I try to imitate him? Because true love is not a yes or no answer. The question, do you truly love somebody, is not yes or no. It is a resume, it's a portfolio, right? It's going to let you know what have you done to show yourself that you truly appreciate and love that person. The second kind of love, or the second kind of proof for love, is sacrifice. Okay? Is absolute sacrifice. And you see this a lot. You see this in all kinds of relationships. How many of you, any mothers in the room tonight? Any mothers? Okay. Did you say that if you love your children? Okay. Did you say that you would sacrifice a lot for them? Yeah. I mean, definitely. And one of the one of the wisdoms in getting older, I think, for younger people, because I deal with 13-year-olds and I deal with 23-year-olds and I deal with 33-year-olds, is that as people get older, they begin to really realize how much their parents sacrifice. And it's something that, like, you want to make sure that when you're young, the only rule you should follow is just shut up. <laughs> Don't say anything that you're going to regret later on. Because when you turn 23, you're going to be like, oh my gosh. Right? I had kids who were, when they were 13, they used to speak so poorly to their parents. They went to college, and they filled out FAFSA. <laughs> <laughs> and they saw what their parents were making. And they felt so upset at themselves for ever yelling at their parents for not buying the latest game system or a new pair of shoes every six months. Because they saw what their parents' annual income was. And their parents did such a good job of trying to hide that from their experience. So they would always try to get the new clothes on Eve, even though they couldn't afford it. They would always try to make sure that they had a little bit of cash for the weekends to go to the movies with their friends. And once they saw that, I had friends come to tell me they, they broke down tears in their eyes, ran to their parents and just hugged them. 
could have said I had no idea that's what you were making. And I used to treat, like, when I moved out of my apartment, dude, I moved my mom and I, okay, I'm half Egyptian. Anyone here half Egyptian? Anyone here Egyptian at all? Half Egyptian is so specific. I'm like, anyone here half Egyptian? Okay, so you're Egyptian, half Egyptian, okay. Like, Egyptian mom? Yeah, Egyptian mom? You're full Egyptian. Are you full Egyptian? Half. Half? Mom or dad? Father, okay. Well, that's a, that's a different experience, but Egyptian mothers, like, well, not, not Egyptian mothers, dude, like, intense, okay? Very intense experience. I love my mom, but we butt heads like crazy, right? But, like, to the point where, like, she'd be like, wear black, and I'm not wearing white. <laughs> and she's like, wear white. I said, no, I want to wear black, right? So that's just us growing up. Now from the time, I'm just like, mom, tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it, because I understand the value of our relationship. But you know how moms are, man. Sometimes you leave the house, it's a little bit cold. The day like today, they'll tell you to what? Get a jacket on. This is such a funny story. Like, get a jacket on. And you're like, I'm not cold. Because when you're young, your body for some reason doesn't have nerves. And so like, you go, I remember playing football when it was 20 degrees outside and being like, it's so hot. Right? And now it's like 64 and I'm like, a little bit chilly. Right? Like, get a little bit cold. My mom used to say, get a jacket on. And I'd be like, what would we say back? I'm fine. No, don't worry about it. I'm fine. And then your mom would be like, no. My mom used to pull this at the clunch. She used to say, what are people going to think about your mother? <laughs> and I used, to, I used to be like, how selfish is that? You're going to make me wear a jacket because you're concerned that people are going to think poorly of you. And subhanAllah, now I'm 26 years old. I work with all of you. When it's cold and they're not wearing a jacket, I'm like, what was their mother thinking? <laughs> and I was like, oh, how is not wearing a jacket? Right? It's true. They know everything. Moms are just so on point. So you have, where was I even going with this? Okay, so you have this, this immense amount of sacrifice that my mom used to come when I forgot my lunch, she used to come drop it off, right? All kinds of sacrifice. And motherhood has sort of become like a symbol of sacrifice, so much so that the work for the womb that the mother, you know, protects and nurtures the baby when it's in development is called the rahim. The rahim, right? And what does that share the same root word with? Rahma, which in Arabic means what? Mercy. Why are they connected? See, the Arabs are very interested in their language development. Why are they connected? Why is Rahm not connected to Rahim? Because there is no person that's more merciful, no relationship that's more merciful, or more symbolic of mercy than a relationship with a mother to the child. Right? So that's sacrifice. So then we ask ourselves, do we love the Prophet Muhammad Now the answer again is not yes or no. It's I love, I imitate him, I love him in the fruit that I imitate him, and I sacrifice for what he taught me. So we're watching a game, playoff game. Anyone, anyone still, like, anyone a fan of the Nets? Or that just seems like, okay, all right, cool. Prom, sex, ed, Nets. I like this. <laughs> so, no, Nets aren't like accepted as a New York team? No. No? Not yet? Still working on it? They try, they're trying, man. They're trying. Jay Z is like part owner or something like that. Some guy in Russia, like Gorbachev or something, like the other half of it. <laughs> so, the, 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 uh, the amount of sacrifice that you show, or the amount of invitation that you show, will dictate how much you love that thing, right? And so understand that it's not it's not lip service, it is simply a portfolio. The next point, the third point, we're almost finished, inshallah. This is interesting, okay? So this is again talking about the shade of Prophet Muhammad. The Sunnah, which to define that for those of us who don't know what that means, the Sunnah is, is the lifestyle of the Prophet Muhammad. The the sort of guidelines and advices that he gave to us. And the Sunnah, this is a point, I want everyone to mentally note this, okay? Because I'll be dealing with young people and sometimes they just don't get it. The Sunnah is always relevant to all times and all places. Always relevant, okay? What is a good story to highlight this point? Well, this is a very, very big issue amongst Muslim youth today, and that is the gender interaction issue and the difficulty with fitna, right? The brothers are like throwing out fitna like it's the first word they ever learned, right? Come on, we're like fitna, right? Like, so they're throwing out fitna, and someone wants to mention that fitna on camera talk. Fitna. Fitna. Like, she has a name, dude. Like, her name is Samaria. Right? So we're talking to some, you know, some of the brothers, and I'm trying to tell them, well, you know, like maybe you should look into like, you know, getting engaged, getting married, inshallah, like see what you can do if it's if it's so if the tribulation, the trial is so difficult on you. And they're like, man, I can't do I finish school, my parents are like this, you gotta be 28, got three houses, got three cars, got three cats for some reason, I'll be a doctor, and it's all kinds of like I'm like, okay, like I can talk to your parents, but until then, until you can pull it off. Then the Prophet system advised us to what? Fast, right? Fast. Because fasting is a means to sort of discipline the, the lower self and sort of keep the desires in check, okay? And what's the response I get when I tell a young male from America or England to fast when 
he feels kind of, what's the response I get? I'm hungry. I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hungry. Okay. Uh, I'm kidding, that was good. No, I don't get that. That's really good. And I'm really impressed with the little bit. I don't even know who it is. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I just need to serve that. The response, anyone? Um, does he say, don't need to fast and control what I learned myself? So there's that, which is just a lie. Okay? <laughs> then what else? There's one that's very common. It's, and the problem is this was that 1,400 years ago in Arabia, man, all these women were in a cobbed up and like walking around all like modest with like shut up. Like I'm like, they're like, I'm in America right now. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. Show me where the hadith says in Sahih Bukhari there's an asterisk and it says except for if you're in America. Right? <laughs> Fasting does not work for you. And the point I'm trying to make is that the lifestyle of the Prophet is never ever irrelevant. It's classic. It always works, right? It's traditional, but it always works. And the, the thing that I wanted to kind of promote was this sort of idea of getting over yourself. One of my friends, Hakko Bedla, uh, Long Island native, he has this great line, get over yourself. I think a lot of people feel like, man, the sunnah is not relevant to me, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's and traditions are not relevant to me, they won't work for me. But the interesting thing is when I ask people if they try to, they're like, no. Right? They just kind of assume that it'll never work for them. So what I tell them is, hashtag, get over yourself. Okay? <laughs> and just try it out and see if it works. And if you have the understanding of the sunnah that it's always relevant to those words, then I promise you you'll see some benefit in your life from it. I promise you that you will. And this is one of the benefits of the Prophet Sallallahu and one of the shades that he provided to us. Now the fourth, the fourth point from this talk that I want to make is this. One thing that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam teaches us is that in order for someone to grow stronger, they first have to acknowledge their weaknesses. That a person can never ever grow in strength if they don't know what areas they are deficient in or what they lack in. And you find this time and time again with how he responded to certain members of the community who had come to him. There's a famous story of a young person who came to the Prophet Sallallahu and very point blank, he came to the Prophet and said, Ya Allah, can I get a fatwa to have sex with this girl? And he was in front of all the companions, and the companions were like, what kind of person, <laughs> what kind of person walks into a room and like, hey, can I get a fatwa? Right, like, who, who does that? Who does that? They were so embarrassed on behalf of this young man. Now the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was extremely modest, extremely honorable, extremely noble, and he could have responded like, no, you're a pervert. No. <laughs> but again, he understood that this person was coming to the Prophet Sallallahu approach this approachable Prophet Sallallahu with an admitting of a weakness. Because he didn't just go and commit zina. Think about this for a second. He didn't just go and do what he wanted. He came to the Prophet Sallallahu and said, I have a weakness. And I want you to give me a religious edict <laughs> to allow me to indulge in this weakness. Okay? So the Prophet Sallallahu he appreciated that. He appreciated that the person was out of their denial phase and they were actually admitting, I have this issue. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, let me ask you a question. He said, do you have any relatives in your family, whether they're immediate or they're extended, who are females, who are women, that you respect, honor, love, cherish? And he said, yes, of course I do. Who doesn't? My mother, sister, etc. And he said, how would you feel then if a young man came to me and asked me for permission to do what you're asking for with one of the, with one of the, the women in your family? And he said, I'd be furious, right? I'd be so furious. That's my sister, that's my mother, that's my, you know, et cetera, X, Y, Z. So the Prophet said, why don't you think for a moment then and imagine how someone would feel, a guy or the, the, one of the family members of this girl would feel if they knew that you were asking for this. The companion who came to the Prophet so someone asked for that, that, that sort of uh, permission, he narrated in the hadith that when I was going towards the Prophet, asking him for that, he said, there was nothing in my heart more beloved to me than sex and fornication. He said, when I was leaving that, gathering, there was nothing more hated to me than unlawful sex and fornication. That experience where the Prophet Sallallahu transformed that person's weakness into a strength. And so when we look at the shade of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when we're, when we're trying to benefit from the shade of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have to come to it with an open mind. A person who tries to come and try to get fixed and they say, I have nothing wrong with myself, will never benefit in any sort of way. So we have to do a self-inventory. And this is part of being a mindful person, this is part of mental health. Ask yourself, when you're in this room tonight, before you leave, ask yourself, what are one, two, or three things that I can improve on in my life? One person's like, I only got one, right? No. <laughs> right? We've all got plenty, but let's keep it short so that we can make it effective. What are one, two, or three things that we can improve on in our lives? What are one, two, or three things that we can benefit from being in the shade of the prophet for myself? So then, the reason why I love the talk or the title, In the Shade of the Prophet, much more than In the Shadow of the Prophet, which is so much why I changed it. <laughs> you guys should fire your reference for that, by the way. Don't tell them that I did Okay, so, it's because the shade has amazing qualities, 
Okay, and this is the conclusion of my talk for tonight. Shade has amazing qualities. What are some of the qualities of shade? When do we seek shade? Huh? On a hot day. Does it get hot in New York in the summer? Very hot, right? And shade becomes like a like a really high commodity. Like shade, everyone's seeking out shade. And so shade is sought out when the environment is tough to deal with. And so this is a beautiful metaphor of the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad is that when the environment figures out to be, or figures to be tough for someone to deal with, they should run into the shade. And the shade for humanity is to follow the best examples, the example of the Prophet Muhammad What else is in the shade? What else is a requirement to be in the shade? Hmm? That was good. I liked it. I heard what you said. I just want to say it a lot. Getting up. Getting up. Like, you can't just be like, man, that shade looks real nice. Right? <laughs> You're like, I wonder if Darth Vader shade. <laughs> you can't just do that. You have to get up and go to the shade, right? And that ties in directly to my next point, which is proximity. How can somebody be far away from the tree and expect to benefit from the shade? There's no way. And so if we want to benefit from this shape that's going to cool us from the temptations and the, and the trials and the difficulties of our environment, of our lives, then we have to have proximity to the problem of ourselves at them. Without proximity, we'll be too far away from benefiting in the shade. And once you're in the shade, what will you expect to find dropping at your feet into your hands from the tree? Fruit, right? The fruit that the tree gives off. And that is that when you are close to the problem of ourselves at them, when you get up and go into his proximity, when you benefit from it, when you're trying to stay away from the difficulties, you will find these fruits that you would never ever expect it to be there. You will find these sort of extra added bonus that you never ever expect to be a part of the experience, but that's part of the product of being close to the product of the I want to thank everybody. I, I like to keep my talks relatively short and just small and you know, a couple take home points so that everyone can walk away not feeling exhausted and tired. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor to spend some time with you. Inshallah, we'll have a Q&A as well. Um, Let's start with a juicy one, yes? Okay, no, alright. Let's get it. Okay, no, we'll do the juicy one. What are some tips on telling your parents about a person you want to marry? What do we have to say, everybody? So, uh, here are my advices. <clears throat> As somebody who got married in college, here are my advices. Oh my gosh, okay. Aww. Sorry, I was not top of this. Um, number one is that you, your parents, they raised you, they changed your uh, diaper, and then when you pooped 37 seconds later, they changed it again. Um, and then when you threw over that dowel over that octane brand new white carpet, right after you drank, Strawberry Sprite. Uh, your parents took care of you, cleaned up, did all these things. So what ends up happening with young adults is that they get to a point where they're so utterly dependent on their parents, then we develop a little bit of independence and autonomy, and then it goes from like car rides home where we literally will not shut up about like what we did at school. We're like, we ate crayons today. And your parents are like, you did what? Like, it was good, I like red, right? <laughs> And then you get to like age 13, 14, and like your parents are like, so how was school? You're like, it was nothing. <laughs> no one understands me. And you just slam the door, right? So there's a huge disconnect that happens. And then what also happens later on is that you go to college, you might find someone that you like. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> you go to college, you find someone that you like, and then you, you start to talk to them. And because parents aren't always the most approachable, we start to kind of develop our own game plan without our parents being involved. And that actually is really bothersome for a lot of parents. When a lot of young people come to me and say that, I found someone I want to marry, my parents are saying no. A lot of the parents just kind of tell me, we wish that we were involved from the beginning. Like, you found somebody, you planned the date, you picked the day in caterers, and it's just like we're getting invited to your wedding. Like, we're not helping you, we're not helping you choose somebody, there's no process. And so, one of my advice is to tell your parents early, you want to... You want to get married, or even if you found that person, just act like you haven't. Just be like, hey, you're kind of, you know, get to that age. I am 15, you know. <laughs> and just kind of like, kind of just drop it on like that, go soft, and then that way you have that conversation a couple times, and then when they start saying, okay, yeah, you are getting to that age, and you're like, well, this is really nice, you know, sister, or nice brother at school that I met, they, they're all in my classes, and I don't know. I want to see what you think about them. I want to get your opinion. If you can 
phrase it that way where you're coming to them as, as consultants and you're not telling them, I taught this person, culture of Islam, don't, either no Islam or culture, it's just Islam, like, then your parents are just going to be like, who are you? Like, what is going on? Communicate it very often, very early, and allow your parents to have a very meaningful say in the conversation. Um, or at least, you know, try to, try to frame it as such, inshallah. Because the biggest issue that happens is people just kind of spring up on their parents and they're like, so caught off guard that their reactions to uh, the shock. Uh, next question. I know we should always have hope, but it sucks to realize that we are further away from the generations of the perfect Ummah during the Prophet Sallallahu time. That's point number one. We're going to talk about that. Number two, the worse they get, what solace comes from the idea that the Ummah will, will get worse and worse. Okay, uh, so the first thing is that this idea that the Prophet Sallallahu was the perfect Ummah is actually a flawed idea. They were the best of people. But there was a lot of serious issues going on over there back then. I mean, there was fornication, there was a lot of uh, drinking, there was, um, you know, murder. There was a lot of stuff going on. There was a famous battle called the Battle of Qadisiyah, where one of the people in the battle at the time, his name was Abu Minjin, and he actually was caught drinking during the battle. And this is kind of a big deal because if you're at a point where you can sacrifice your life for your country, as Abu Minjin was, imagine being at that spiritual state, but then also at the state where you are okay with drinking, right? So it's kind of like a conflict or a contradiction. Now, Abu Mishnah was caught, and they put him under house arrest. Saad ibn Waqas al Quran. he caught him put him under house arrest. And Abu Mishnah felt really terrible, okay? So he was caught drinking. So again, this idea of a perfect Ummah, not quite perfect, the best generation yet, but they also had their struggles. So what did Abu Mishnah do? Well, he sat in the house and he felt really guilty for a long time. Because everybody else is out there supporting, defending their, their, their country and countrymen and countrywomen. And he's sitting in the house and he's just like, man, I made such a stupid mistake. I shouldn't have done this. Why did I do that? So Saad and Abu Waqas' wife is in the house and he's like begging her. He's like, please let me go. Let me redeem myself. Let me go back out there and help my people. And she says, nope, you already had your chance. You messed up. And he says, please, please, I beg you. She says, no. He says, okay, let's make a deal. If I go out there, and I go and I help defend my people, and I die as a martyr, then that's it. It's done. My life is over. But if I end up living, then I will come back to the house as a prisoner. Like, I'll come back. I'm not going to run away. Don't be afraid. She said, okay, I have your word. So yes, my word is yours. Okay. So he wrapped his face up so that no one would recognize him, and he went out, and he started to battle. Now, what's interesting is that he was already a really, really good fighter. But because of the guilt he had and the mistake that he made, that guilt propelled him to like this new height of fighting. And so when Saad ibn Waqas, who originally caught him drinking, saw this masked man fighting so valiantly, he said, man, who is that guy? And all the generals started looking over and like, man, that guy's a boss. And then Saad said, if I didn't know that he was in my house right now, I would say that was a mention. Right? So there was a sort of like, the difference in the Ummah of previous, or the previous Ummah of the Prophet was that when they made mistakes, which they did, they used that guilt to propel them to tell them, right? So the question is not whether or not who's better, who's this or that. The question is, are we following their example? When we make a mistake, are we using that guilt or that regret as a fuel to get us closer to Allah SWT? Or are we just wallowing in our own pity? Or even worse, do we not even feel anything? Are we spiritually apathetic? Do we have spiritual neuropathy? Where we know that all of you are pre-meds, so you don't know what that is, right? <laughs> We have spiritual neuropathy where we don't even feel that anymore, right? That's a huge issue that we don't even feel that. And so, number one, there is no such thing. Number two is that the Prophet ﷺ has a very famous hadith where he said, my ummah is like the rain. My ummah is like the rain. And then he clarified what he meant. He said, you don't know which is the best part, the beginning or the end. And so what he means by that is that the rain at the time of the Prophet ﷺ was seen as what? Rain in the desert, what is it? Huh? Mercy, yeah, it's a huge mercy. And they use it to get, you know, for irrigation, to uh, take care of the crops and such. And rain traditionally has a very strong period and a very weak period. You know what I'm talking about? When it rains, sometimes it comes out really heavy, and then you'll have drizzle for like 30 minutes. Sometimes it'll come in slow as drizzle, and it'll start pouring for the next 30 minutes. So the Prophet says, my hope is like the rain. We're not sure what the best part is, the beginning or the end. And there's also there's many narrations where he's talking about my brothers, my sisters, people who are coming after me, who have never seen me 
but will believe in me, follow me, as if they have seen me. And he talks about how much he misses us in, in, the, uh, in the future tense. And so, don't ever get down on yourself for being part of this Ummah that is not perfect, that is so flawed. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi talked about how our struggles and our weaknesses actually become our strengths once we realize them. Um, how do you know something is meant for you and you are put through trials or that Allah SWT is telling you not to do it, i.e. marriage? <laughs> Literally. And that's a serious question. I think like there was a point in my time where so when I married my wife, it took me like two years just to convince her parents to let us get married. It wasn't because I, she's uh, from Bangladesh and I'm uh, half Egyptian, half white, but it was because we were young. I think I was 18, she was 17. That's just how I roll, homie. So, uh, <laughs> so her parents were like really concerned, and it took us two years just to get to that point where they would even let us confirm that we wanted to get married, right? So one thing I would say is that if it happens, it was meant to happen. If it doesn't, it wasn't. Right. It's one of those things like we have limited capacity, limited intellectual capacity, so we can only try so much. And if something is meant to happen, it'll happen. If it's not, it won't. It's already something that's already written. We just kind of have to do our part. Now, as far as taking signs, that's another question, right? Is it, is it, am I being blocked or is it just an obstacle? Well, it's pretty, let me just give you a scenario. If you go to somebody's family, or parent, or a person, let's say you're proposing to somebody, and you say, hey, I'm interested in you, and they just say no. <laughs> like, no, I'm not interested. And you tell from their tone that they're really not interested. Then that probably, person's probably not interested. Right? <laughs> but if you go, and they're like, well, I'm not really looking right now. Right? <laughs> then she wants you to chase her a little bit. Okay? <laughs> Write that down. Uh, <laughs> no, or they say things like, well, I'm not sure... I was really busy with school, things like that. These are all excuses to get you away from her. But, at the same time, notice how the door is not completely shut. Now, if he is married, sisters, then the door is completely shut, probably, right? And if she's married, then yes, it's completely shut. But you just have to gauge it, you just have to play it, like, see, uh, based on tone and things like that. And then always ask Allah SWT to guide. And you'll see, subhanAllah, when you pray the Istikhara, the beautiful thing about Istikhara is that it'll make your heart content with what you're supposed to be content with. That when you pray to Allah SWT, Allah give me what's best for me and save me from anything that's not good for me. And if this is good, give it to me. If it's bad, replace with something better. Then you'll find that your heart will be content with the with the, the fork in the road that you're supposed to choose. Right? So, so the morning after, the day after, the week after, you'll start feeling more and more inclined towards a certain way. And go ahead and choose that way. The Prophet SWT said, he said, the he said, ask your heart. So always follow what your heart kind of leads you towards as long as it's guided by goodness. With so many interpretations and viewpoints by Islam and different communities, how do we train ourselves to continue to love our loved ones despite their difference in belief or action? Good question. Could be related to mental health, uh, tariqa, could be related to anything, a lot of things. Different interpretation. Um, I think it's important to understand one thing. With the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had a variety of different opinions amongst his community. Uh, so many different kinds of people, so many different uh, backgrounds, so many different understandings. It's kind of a, it's a fallacy to think that they have one understanding. Um, you know, if any of you have taken Shaykh the Nasr class in equal prayer, you'll know that there were six different Tashahads at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. While he was alive, right? Six, at least. And so, understand that. The Prophet was alive and there were six different ways of ending the prayer. What does that mean? That means that pluralism and diversity are allowed in this religion, are encouraged. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? Allah Subhanahu Wa says, and those who strive for us, we will, uh, we will provide for them paths. S, okay? Not one path. Not sabirina, subulana. Meaning what? That everyone has a different path to Allah SWT. As long as that path is headed toward La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, and is amongst the ijma'a, like what the scholars agree on the consensus, then you're good, right? The direction has to be one direction. <laughs> but the paths can be parallel, they can be parallel, they can be side by side. Okay? And also humanize people. It's very easy to hate people when you don't know anything about them. But the minute you humanize them, it becomes very difficult to hate them. And so, to be like, oh, that Salafi brother, or that Tablighi brother, or that liberal, that progressive. But if you know their name, you know that they have two brothers and two sisters, and you know that they work at Walgreens on weekends, it's very difficult to hate somebody when you humanize them. So get to know each other, alright? Get to know one another. For 
students who often contemplate suicide or just uh, thoughts not meant to be had, do you think that a psychiatrist, or do you think that a psychiatrist is beneficial? I know many people who think that being depressed is wrong. No, absolutely not. Um, it's a serious question. I, I wouldn't laugh. Um, I would definitely go see a therapist for sure. I would definitely go talk to somebody. Uh, and oftentimes your universities have therapists that are okay to talk to you. The person can be most of more not Muslim. There's really, I mean, therapy is very inherently spiritual and humanistic, in my opinion. And so that's why you find that a lot of the greatest therapists in history were spiritual people. So even if the person is not Muslim, that's okay. Go talk to them. Just kind of get some stuff off your chest and get some stuff off your mind. The problem is that had many therapists that he would talk to. He had, obviously, his spouses. He had angels who realized that. And most importantly, he had Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He had God. So don't think that talking about your problems is a weakness. In fact, it's a way for you to direct those troubles and grow from them. Um, and yes, I, I, I definitely advocate seeing somebody to talk, talk to you about these things. And lastly, where can we find more information on the Prophet so we can we, we can relate to him better? There are three resources I'm going to give you. Number one, Tariq Ramadan. Everyone ever heard of Tariq Ramadan? My man first Monday, every Monday. Uh, Tariq Ramadan, he has a book called In the Footsteps of the Prophet so One of the best guys, selfie in progress in the back. Is that what it looks like? I feel like I got National Geographic. Sorry, I didn't call you out. I just had to. I just had to do it. Sorry. Listen, just post it, inshallah. Everyone will remember it. We laugh. Oh, well. Right? So, Tarvin Law's book. If you don't want to be caught up, don't the bone so high. No, I feel bad now. No, don't feel bad. Okay, thanks. No, don't feel bad. Okay. Alright. Tarvin In the Footsteps of the Prophet, one of the best hero books I've ever read. It's not the biggest, it's not the, it's not the most lengthy, it's not the most, uh, you know, difficult vocabulary, but man, does he get the point across. He is a great writer, mashallah, and he is able to extrapolate some of the most uh, heart-softening points from all these stories. It's not as detailed as other resources, but it's a great, great primer and start. And if you have anybody who is not Muslim or is hearing from Islam, and they want to learn about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I highly recommend that one, because it's just written so well. The second is Sheikh Abdul Nasser Jamal, my teacher. He has a Sierra podcast. For those of you who like to listen to stuff on commutes or drives or trains, and you like to just kind of like put it in your ears and listen to it, Sheikh Abdul Nasser's podcast is great. It's very thorough. But for those of you who know Sheikh Abdul Nasser, you know that his storytelling ability is really good. And so as, even though it's detailed, it's very easy to listen to, which is a rare combination to have. And the last one is Muhammad Man and Prophet by Abdul Salahi. That's a big book. That's, that's like an encyclopedia. But it's written in a very narrative <coughs> format. So instead of being like, you know, date, event, date, event, like some other serial books, it talks to you in the uh, narrative format. So it's kind of like this really beautiful uh, flow of the story of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Those are the three that I can say. And, and make dua to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Pray to Allah that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala grants you love of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and love of that which he loves. Um, speaking of love, I love you all so much for inviting me here. Uh, just talking about and everybody. Uh, I have to head out, so if I if I dip and you're like, wait, I want to take a selfie. Uh, now that I'm telling you, there was a brother who came and did it, okay? And as he walked away, my son, he fist bumped. Uh, so, so if I have to run before we take selfies and all that, then please forgive me, but I'm giving, like I said, I'm going to Maryland right now to go give a talk tomorrow. So I got to dip because I got to wake up early and rehearse, whatever that means. Uh, so please forgive me for that, inshallah. And thank you so much. It's an honor to spend time with you. You're also wonderful, beautiful people inwardly and out. Uh, Zach Malte, and Malte, and Malte.